Before we begin, I want to give a quick thank you to Horror Junkie for becoming the newest author on the channel. He's given me permission to narrate his stories here, and I'm very, very excited to share some of the scares that I've already found myself with you all, including tonight's story. It's a fun one, but it's also absolutely terrifying. So, go to his links down below, show him some love, and read some of his stories on your own. But until then, let's get started. Does your hometown have an urban legend? Some forbidden lore that everyone has heard but actively avoids mentioning. I guarantee my story has any tall tale conjured up by the internet beat by a mile. I come from a small town, population of only around 1,500 people. I'm going to keep the name of the town anonymous, so that's no brave-hearted urban explorers come searching for it. It's safer that way. My town's curious case revolves around the Chuck E. Cheeses that sit abandoned, tucked away in the desolate north side of town. My home was a bustling metropolis for a short period before I was born, but the hype quickly fizzled out after our main factory plant, along with most of the town's business, relocated elsewhere. Chuck E. Cheese, as well as most of the other successful franchises in the area, no longer had the foot traffic to keep its doors open, slowly deteriorating into the decrepit shell of a structure we're left with today. The buzz over the place all began when Johnny Cameron vanished about 25 years ago. He was only seven years old. Supposedly, Johnny and his brother Alex hatched a scheme to sneak out and ride their bikes to the old Chuck E. Cheese after their parents called it a night. They executed their plan without a hitch. No one heard the boys leave the house that night, and they managed to make it to Chuck E. Cheese undetected. No one can say for sure what happened next. What we do know is that the Camerons panicked when they awoke to find their son's beds vacant in the morning. The police were called. A town-wide search was conducted. Alex Cameron was found curled up in a ball in front of the derelict Chuck E. Cheese building, muttering the same phrase over and over again. Where a kid can be a kid. Where a kid can be a kid. Where a kid can be a kid. That's all anyone has ever been able to get out of him since the incident. Rumor has it he went into a psychiatric ward not long after. And rumor has it he's still there. The cops combed through every inch of that place, and all they had to show for it was a single shoe, worn by Johnny the night he went missing, found half-submerged in the ball pit. The years ticked by, and without any traces of their son, the Cameron family quickly crumbled. Brady Cameron couldn't withstand the mystery and grief caused by the loss of his sons. He ate a bullet from a 9mm a couple of years after Johnny disappeared. With the rest of her family either dead, missing, or locked away in a mental asylum, Susan Cameron subsequently spiraled into a life of alcoholism and drug abuse. She could often be witnessed strung out in the same parking lot that her eldest son was found in years prior, mumbling incoherently to herself. The police found her body there one morning, about a decade after her boy's disappearance. She'd overdosed, and a toxicology report indicated that a concoction of various drugs were coursing through her bloodstream at the time of her death. <laughs> at least that's what people say. Years of speculation without any clear suspects culminated into the urban legend we mull over to this day. Many people believe there's something sinister hiding in that Chuck E. Cheese, lurking amongst the long-forgotten arcade games. And I can tell you, firsthand, they're absolutely right. Everyone calls it the Cameron's Curse. According to legend... Whoever steps foot in that place is destined to a fate worse than death, and their loved ones will be plagued with unimaginable suffering for years to come. I've always been a skeptic when it comes to that sort of thing, and I've never been one to believe in ghosts or any of those cheesy don't-call-yourself-at-3am type videos on YouTube. I derived more pleasure from debunking myths like those. That's how I wound up in the conundrum I'm currently in. 
I was 12 at the time this occurred. I was hanging out with my best friends, Jack and Henry. We were taking a stroll around town like we usually resorted to most summer nights due to the town's lackluster variety of entertainment. Hey, get off your phone and watch where you're walking. Jack hissed at Henry as he narrowly avoided a collision. Who are you texting anyway? I've never seen you so invested in that thing. I chimed in as Henry slipped his phone into his pocket. Sorry, guys. Remember that girl Jessica I was telling you about? I asked for a number before we got out on summer break. I think we're really hitting it off. Henry bragged as his face flushed with color. That's awesome, bro. Jessica's hot. You have any plans to hang out yet? I prodded. I was proud of my friend. Henry typically kept to himself and tended not to socialize with many people outside of me and Jack. Not yet, but I think I'm going to ask her if she wants to chill at Ford Lake with me sometime next week. Henry admitted excitedly. I really think she'll let... He was cut off mid-sentence as Jack rudely interjected. No way you're talking to Jessica, dude. She's way too fine. I bet you're texting your mommy instead. Baby, what is blanky? He cooed. The smug grin plastered on his face at it all. Jack had managed to get under Henry's skin, and we knew it. Jack was always the kind of stir of trouble. Shut the fuck up, you asshole. You're just jealous she's not talking to you. Henry screamed as tears began welling up in his eyes. <sighs> I could get her number if I tried, bro. I just don't... F Jack spun around as he realized I'd frozen in my tracks. Cole, hurry up! Jack called to me. I didn't respond. Henry and Jack quickly forgot about their squabble as they traced my glance to identify what I was staring at. The color drained from their faces as they joined me in gawking at the abandoned chunky cheese across the street. Something thick permeated the air, and I had trouble putting my finger on it at first. Fear. We stood speechless for what seemed like an eternity before Henry broke the silence. How did we walk this far? We haven't even been out here for that long, he stammered. I don't know, but we should probably start heading back, I mumbled, still partially in a trance. Just as we turned to go back, Jack pointed in front of us and screamed, Cops! Sure enough, there was a police cruiser a little ways up the road crawling toward our position. Come on, this way! I yelled as we all broke into a sprint. We were well out past curfew, and none of us wanted to deal with the repercussions we'd surely face if we were caught. Before I could fully grasp where I'd taken us, we found ourselves bent over, catching our breaths behind the very building we'd been gaping at moments prior. You think they're gone? Henry wheezed, one hand gripping his chest. I, I don't know. Let me check. I sputtered between heavy breaths. My heart felt like it was ready to burst through my chest as I struggled to take in enough oxygen to satiate my burning lungs. As I made my way to peer around the corner of the building, blue light flooded the surrounding area, providing us with our answer. Suddenly, a gravelly voice boomed over a megaphone. Boys! Come out with your hands up. I know you're back there. Officer Jenkins. He was my least favorite of the town's minuscule police presence. We had to pray that he hadn't caught a glimpse of our faces or he'd definitely snitch to our parents. What do we do? Henry asked, terror audible in his voice. Oh, I don't know about you, but I think I can do without 20 licks in a month of grounding. Jack uttered as he nodded toward an employee entrance. The yellowing employee's only sign was barely legible, peeling off the rusty, weather-beaten purple door. Yeah, I'm with you. Jenkins would probably make up some bullshit story about a shoplifting or something. I agreed. But what about the curse? Henry retorted. His eyes grew wide as the words left his lips. Right on cue, Jenkins' voice cut back over the megaphone. Don't make me come back there. That was all the convincing Henry needed. We were practically falling over each other as we clumsily stumbled to the door. 
Strangely, the employee entrance was already slightly ajar. We didn't have time to consider this before we piled inside, Jack locking the door behind us. After the initial panic subsided and our eyes adjusted to the dark, we drank in our surroundings. Looks like we're in some break room, Henry squeaked. He was right. It was evident that the break room had been used in some time. The room was dimly illuminated by moonlight through a tiny window bordering the exit. To our right, a thick layer of dust coated two foldable tables, each accompanied by four filthy chairs. In the corner, a vintage tube TV jutted out from the wall, held in place by a flimsy-looking plastic arm. To the left of the TV stood a dingy old refrigerator. A pool of some unknown brown substance was seeping from beneath it. Hugging the corner of the wall next to the refrigerator sat a water-stained rusted sink. On the left wall, a row of dilapidated purple lockers loomed, casting a murky shadow that made it even harder to see in the already poorly lit room. We barely had a chance for the full weight of where we were standing to sink in before Jenkins' muffled voice spurred us to move. Let's go hide just in case Jenkins manages to get in, I mumbled softly to the others, gesturing toward the door on the other side of the room. Jack and Henry nodded in agreement, but I could tell they were just as terrified as I was. Our eyes were wide as dinner plates, and Henry was trembling softly as we made our way out of the break room. As we passed by the fridge, the putrid scent of rotting food assaulted our nostrils, leading us to quicken our pace. I slowly pushed open the door to the break room as we prepared to find somewhere to hide. A feeling of nervous trepidation crawled up my spine as we gazed out into the vast expanse of the room. The space was massive. Squinting, I could make out the ticket booth at front with vintage stuffed animals behind the counter, waiting in vain for some lucky child to come claim their prize. Scattering most of the room lay a sea of ancient arcade games. Their power had been cut long ago, and it was obvious that they hadn't been operational in some time. To our right, eight metal picnic tables lined the dining area. Empty pizza boxes littered the tops of most of them. Further past the unkempt table sat a children's play area, a jungle of intertwining colorful plastic tubes stationed in the corner. At its end was a long, purple slide that led straight into the ball pit. I shuddered at the thought of Johnny Cameron's shoe buried within the colorful orbs. My sense of unease only intensified as I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I snapped my head directly to the right, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. There was a stage bulging out from the back wall of the room that I'd somehow missed on my initial sweep. Atop it stood three insanely creepy animatronics that looked like they'd came straight out of Five Nights at Freddy's. Their heads were cocked to the side, staring, no, glaring at us. I could feel their cold, hateful eyes boring into my chest. The one closest to us, a chef with an exaggerated black mustache, scowled menacingly down at us with an expression of pure rage. Holy shit, I muttered under my breath. Let's get moving, Jack whispered, voice quivering. We made our way cautiously down the seemingly endless rows of arcade games until we were nearly at the front of the store. All of a sudden, Henry put his finger to his lips, indicating that we needed to be silent. Hide, he ordered, almost inaudibly. We scattered and crouched behind adjacent arcade games. I had a clear view of Henry and Jack from my position. Henry was pointing to the employee restroom to the left of the ticket booth, all color drained from his face. The door slowly creaked open. I started to get lightheaded, and my hands began to shake, beads of sweat forming above my brow. Nothing could have prepared me for what walked out of that door. It was difficult to make out at first in the dimly lit room, but through a glimmer of moonlight I saw it. There before us stood a hideous, human-sized rat. 
monstrosity was at least six feet tall, standing on its hind legs. Its huge yellow eyes looked frenzied with animalistic hunger, and the left one twitched intermittently. Its awkward orange teeth jaggedly protruded from the dark cavernous pit that was its mouth. Its thick matted gray fur was patchy, and some spots were completely bald altogether. Its grotesque pink tail swayed back and forth like a pendulum as the vermin stood. But the thing that disturbed me the most wasn't the vile beast itself. It was the too tight purple t-shirt with the Chuck E. Cheese logo hugging its chest that turned my blood to ice. A sickening realization washed over me like a tidal wave. It was him in the flesh. This was Chuck E. Cheese. I was ripped from my stupor by a commotion out of the corner of my eye. Jack was frantically waving his arms in the air, trying to get our attention. Henry and I took notice about the same time. Jack mouthed something to us, and fortunately we were both close enough to make out what he said. Run on the count of three. Henry nodded. Where? I asked soundlessly. He pointed to the colorful play area at the far corner of the room. I gazed at it for a second, then turned my attention back to Jack. In my peripheral vision, I noticed that Chucky had his wet nose pointed in the air, sniffing wildly. We didn't have much time. Jack held up three fingers. One. My heart was in my throat. Time seemed to slow as adrenaline took over. Two. Every moment felt like a lifetime as I prepared to bolt for it. Jack hesitated for a split second. I could feel the fear radiating from him. Though he tried to conceal it, panic had spread like wildfire across his features. Three! I shot forward with Henry and Jack beside me as we weaved through token-eating machines en route to our target. It hadn't taken long for the massive rodent to give chase. The skittering of claws on carpet further propelled me as the beast closed the gap between us. Then out of nowhere, all the arcade games simultaneously turned on. I was almost blinded by the unanticipated burst of light. Illuminated screens and jingles of ancient video games surrounded us in all directions. A speaker from somewhere overhead crackled to life. It sounded like an old soundbite from a commercial was set on loop. Chuck E. Cheese, where a kid can be a kid, it sang mockingly. There was something sinister behind those words. With each repetition, the voice became more twisted and distorted. I remained focused on my target. I wouldn't let the sudden chaos distract me. We reached the dining area. We were so close. <coughs> Someone screamed from close behind me along with a nauseating thump. It was Jack. I glanced back at him, but I didn't stop. To this day, I still wish I hadn't. My heart sank into my stomach. Chucky had pounced on him and he began burrowing into his abdomen. Jack's face was twisted in pure agony. Every muscle tensed as Chucky greedily ripped away Jack's flesh and tore into his insides. Keep running. Jack choked out through gritted teeth as a pool of blood blossomed beneath him. The disgusting vermin's face was soaked with crimson. Jack flailed and kicked, but it did little good. I looked directly into my friend's pleading eyes and I whispered, I'm sorry. Hot tears splashed down to my face. I was overcome with emotion. I wanted to turn back, to fight, to scream, to find some way to help my friend. But I knew I had to keep going. Henry and I reached the jungle of plastic tubes and we each dove into the cylindrical opening. We crawled on our hands and knees, Henry trailing me until we were lost in the guts of the system of pipes. Jack's tormented wails persisted. A pang of guilt struck me in my chest with each anguished cry. After a few minutes, they grew quieter, until eventually they stopped altogether. When we finally came to a halt, I broke down into a fit of hysterical sobs. Henry grasped my shoulder and spun me around to face him. Jack. He... Blood. Dead. I blubbered, snot streaming from my nose. Cole, look at me, Henry demanded sternly. We have to make it out. And then we can mourn. Right now we have to be brave. We both know what Jack would have wanted. He 
reiterated optimistically. His strength was contagious. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right. I stuttered, wiping tears from my face. A newfound ambition began to bubble inside me. We had to escape that walking nightmare. For Jack. We sat silently for a couple of seconds. The machines outside were still blaring a cacophony of noise, and the speaker had devolved into demonic guttural bellow of that same phrase. Chuck E. Cheese, where a kid can be a kid. Over and over again, I was struck with a deep sense of dread with each syllable, but I did my best to push it to the back of my mind. Cole, I need you to promise me something, Henry uttered solemnly, avoiding eye contact. What is it? I asked quizzically. If I don't make it out of here, he trailed off, lost in thought. Don't talk like that, I retorted, grabbing hold of his arm so he'd meet my gaze. Hey, we will make it out, I responded more confidently than I felt. I know. But if something happens to me, just tell my mom I love her. He murmured despondently as a solitary tear rolled down his cheek. That's not going to just promise me. He stared intently into my eyes, resolve masking his features. I promise. I begrudgingly relented. A tense couple of seconds followed, then we heard it. A loud clunk sounded from somewhere beneath us. Shit. It knows we're in here. We have to keep moving or he'll catch us. Try to find the way out. Henry Whisper screamed at me. He didn't have to tell me twice. I bounded through the winding tunnels, desperately searching for the exit as the scampering behind us grew louder. My knees hurt and I could feel blisters forming on my palms as they met plastic time and time again, working overtime to propel me forward. I turned right, dead end. I looked left, another dead end. Forward was my only option. At last I spotted the opening. Bright light spilled into it. I crawled as fast as my burning hands and knees would carry me. The ear-piercing sound of claws against plastic had grown close. Too close. We had to make it out before Chucky caught up. The final tube sloped downward into the ball pit. I launched myself headfirst into the sea of colored spheres, Henry hot on my heels. I struggled to push the balls aside as I swam toward the edge. I heaved myself out of the ball pit and spun around to hoist Henry out. But when I turned around, Henry wasn't there. That was impossible. I heard him slide down after me. Where could he have gone? I picked up on a rustling within the ball pit. Henry, I whimpered. No response. I was rooted in place, frozen in anticipation. I stared on in horrified apprehension as the disturbance in the pit bubbled to the surface. And then silence. I took a step closer, ready to call Henry's name again when... Boom! An eruption of round plastic shapes exploded into the air. Chucky's hideous form emerged from within the pool, his lower half still hidden from view. His discolored teeth clacked together as fresh blood dripped from his mouth, painting his tattered t-shirt a dark red. He fixated on me, those frantic yellow eyes menacing enough to bore a hole into my skull. I could sense something behind those eyes. Hunger. A deep, animalistic hunger like a tiger who's been deprived of food for weeks. And I was next on the menu. Without warning, Chucky dove back down under the surface. He tore pedo toward me as the balls flew in all directions. I took that opportunity and tore through the remainder of the room back to where we entered that hellhole. Chucky's footfalls thundered after me mere seconds after I took off, the burning, hateful glower of the animatronics following me the whole way. I wasn't religious, but I prayed to any god that would listen that I would make it out of there. The door was fast approaching. I could feel Chucky's wet, musty breath on the nape of my neck as he rapidly closed the distance between us. With one last burst of energy, I crashed through the door, slamming and locking it behind me. A deafening thud rattled the door in its frame just as I turned the lock. 
Another thud immediately followed. I didn't wait to see if the door would hold. I booked it to the employee exit and threw all my weight into it. Wheezing and gasping for breath, I spilled out onto the warm asphalt, scraping my knees, but I didn't care. A nauseating wave of emotions hiding just below the surface suddenly crashed down on me and I cried. I wailed and screamed and called out the name of my friends until my voice was hoarse. After what felt like an eternity, I finally glanced up. Officer Jenkins stood over me, one hand placed on his belt. He wore a grave yet sympathetic countenance, and I discerned pity from his facial expression. The other two, they didn't... He didn't finish his statement. He didn't need to. I slowly shook my head, tears returning to my eyes, threatening to overflow at any moment. Officer Jenkins turned for a second as something wet fell to the ground. He looked back at me solemnly, extending a meaty hand. I sheepishly took it, and he dragged me to my feet. Head hung low, I started toward Officer Jenkins' police cruiser. He grasped my shoulder, and I whipped around to face him. Cole, I'll explain everything to your parents. If anyone asks... You didn't see anything, okay? I nodded. Officer Jenkins stuck to his word. He drove me home and explained everything to my parents. After he left, my mom embraced me and I sobbed like a baby. I, I knew my life wouldn't be the same again. Not without my friends. The weeks that followed were... Some of the toughest of my entire life. I was constantly bombarded with condolences from well-meaning townsfolk. But all the I'm sorry's in the world couldn't bring back my friends. The town held a joint memorial for Henry and Jack. It was a good service. I remember thinking that they honored their memories well. I kept my promise to Henry. His mother was present along with the rest of the town, mourning their loss of her beloved son. After most of the others had gone, I nervously walked up to her. She pulled me into a tight hug. She held me there for a long time and couldn't prevent a flood of tears from streaking down my face. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. I know you two are best friends. Her eyes were sunken and hollow. Miss Abbott, Henry loves you. I managed to choke out among my snivels. A slight shimmer flashed across her eyes and her expression softened a little. Thank you, she whispered as she turned to go. The events of that night have stuck with me my whole life. I miss Jack and Henry more than anything. I still do. Up until this point, I'd never told anyone what happened that night. I left the day I turned 18 and I've never looked back. I'm 27 now, married to the girl of my dreams, and we're expecting our first child in three months. Weird deaths and tragedies have plagued my loved ones ever since. My uncle had his arm cut off in an incident with a wood chipper. My dad died in a car crash a couple of years back. My cousin's house caught fire and left him homeless. I wanted to believe all these events were random. Just complete coincidences, but... I can't any longer. So why am I telling you all this? Why bring it back up after all this time? Well, I'm in a car right now. I'm making the eight-hour trip back to my hometown. I'm going back to that godforsaken place to do what I should have done years ago. Because yesterday, my wife was diagnosed 
with stage four breast cancer. I can't let it take what little I have left in this world. I don't know if it'll work, but I have 10 gallons of gas and a book of matches. I'm going to burn that fucking shit hole to the ground. I hope that ungodly freak of nature is still there because I'm going to make him suffer. Maybe then I'll be able to get that damn catchphrase out of my head. You don't find these places often, Roy said. Probably only a handful of times in a person's life, at least that they notice. When I asked him what he was talking about, I was already dreading the answer. We'd been roommates for five years, and for the most part, we got along and were good friends. But his interests were weird and varied, and when he got on a roll, he could talk your ear off about some obscure topic that was only interesting for a minute or two. And it wasn't like Roy was afraid of shutting me up if he wasn't in the mood to talk. He called it turning his ears off. And he meant it. He'd had cochlear implants since he was a kid, and he didn't mind unplugging them if he didn't want to listen. It'd gone to where I tried to steer around getting into long conversations when we ate together, but this time, it felt different. He was jittery acting, almost like he was scared of something or had gotten some bad news. We were just sitting in our living room eating leftover pasta, but Roy kept looking out the window like he was expecting someone to break in on us. It was weird, you know? Something was wrong. So I asked him what was going on, and he started to say nothing, but then he seemed to change his mind. He told me that you don't find these spots often, but it does happen if only a handful of times in a person's life. I asked him what he meant. And when he kept talking, this time, I listened. It's that feeling you get. Look, have you ever been somewhere and it felt different than it should? Like more empty or more creepy or just like, like you were unsettled, but you didn't know why? That's what it feels like. I'm talking about normal places. Maybe even places you go every day that don't feel normal this time. That's when it happens. Sandra, she... Sandra's that girl I was telling you about. Sandra told me about this game she played when she was a kid. She was an army brat, and she picked it up when she was overseas. Back then, she used to play with a group of kids that told her about a game, which they had apparently learned from another base kid that had come through years before, but they wouldn't actually play it. They acted like they had, but she thought they were lying. They all looked kind of excited and spooked when they brought it up to her, not as an invitation for them all to play, but as a dare to the new girl, or maybe just to impress her. They called it the mumbling game. The name didn't make any sense to her at the time. The game wasn't about mumbling, if you can even call it a game at all. You couldn't play it all the time or at a place of your choosing. There was no score, no way to compete with others. It was just... It's easier if I just tell you what it is instead of what it isn't. The idea was that there are certain places on rare occasions that will feel off. Like I said, lonely or creepy or dangerous in a way that doesn't really make sense. Sandra told me that most people just ignore the feeling or try to leave as quick as they can, but if they stayed, some of those would find a way to play the game. So you enter the room or a hallway, a parking lot or a building. The places can vary a lot. The only real constants are that feeling that something is wrong and that you're always alone when you find one of, well, Sandra called them unsettled spots. If you notice yourself alone in an unsettled spot and you decide to stay, what comes next is simple. You find an area in the center of the space and you sit down. She said you should sit with your legs straight out and your hands palm down on the ground under your butt. So like sitting on the backs of your hands. But she didn't know if that was really needed or just some detail the kid had added. Either way, you sit there and you close your eyes. And if you really are in one of those spots, after a few minutes, you'll hear a loud cracking noise, followed by the sound of a bell. You can open your eyes then, and you'll know right away 
if it worked. Because you won't be alone anymore. There will be a person, or something that looks like a person, sitting or standing nearby, watching you and smiling. They won't talk to you or respond if you talk to them. And they won't approach you at first. They just stare and smile. And sure, maybe by that point you're scared, or at least more than a little freaked out, but at least they aren't trying to grab you or even come closer to you. And that's when you get up and try to leave. Very quickly, you become aware of a few different things. First, no matter how far you go, you won't see another person now, and that feeling of wrongness will stay with you. Second, when you move, this smiling stranger moves with you, step for step. You go 20 steps back, they follow 20 steps. But if you go toward them, they don't retreat. They just keep smiling at you as though sharing the joke or the secret of the strange dance you're doing now. Back and forth, left and right, you can't shake them. And depending on their gaits compared to yours and the directions you take, the gap between you is closing all the time. I would laughed and asked Sandra what was supposed to happen if they caught you. Her face was serious when she answered me. I said the kids don't like talking about that. Not directly, but... The couple of times they had, they'd used a Tagalog word. Sampa. She said it meant something like to climb or to ride. I then asked her the obvious questions. If playing this game got you stuck in some bad version of the world, why would anyone play? And how would anyone know about it if you can't get out to tell them? You can get out, she said, but only by going back the way you got in. If you panic and just run off, or if you get to a place that your new companion has blocked you from getting back, sure, you could be screwed. But as long as you remember it and keep your head, you can usually just go back out the way you came. You'll walk until the bad feeling goes away, and when you turn around, the thing following you will be gone. Sandra said that for days after telling her about the game, the other kids would tease her about it, but it was easy to make excuses as to why she couldn't play, as it just wasn't a very common thing for her to be alone or run across some spot that felt weird. They eventually got bored talking about it and moved on to other things, and by next year, she'd almost completely forgotten about the game. It wasn't until her last weekend before moving back to the States that she had a reminder. She'd cut through the small garden center at the on-base PX. It was like a store for families on the base. Said the store wasn't closed or anything, and it was the middle of the afternoon, but there was no one else around. That wasn't that strange, but something still caused her to stop. She said the light looked weird, and even though she'd been there with her mom a dozen times, she had a scary feeling in her chest that she'd never felt before. It reminded her of the mumbling game, and once that thought came, it had her. Before she knew it, she was sitting down on the dirty concrete in the middle of the garden center and closing her eyes. After a couple minutes, she heard a sharp crack, and then a bell rang nearby. She was scared by then, but she had to open her eyes and check, right? There was a man. Standing on the far side of the garden center now. Just standing there and staring at her. He wasn't dressed in fatigues or a uniform or one of the outfits the people in the store usually wore. Everything he wore was gray. Gray pants and a shirt, even a gray fringe of hair around a pale scalp. Maybe it was her imagination, but the teeth he showed as he smiled at her even looked gray in the light. Her reaction was immediate. She jumped to her feet and started to run out of the garden center, casting a glance back to see if he was following. He was. His stride long enough, he could keep pace without fully having to run yet, and... That's when she remembered the rest. As hard as it was, she made herself stop. And as soon as she stopped, the smiling man following her stopped too. 
Shaking, she made herself think of how she'd come into the garden center and when she'd first started feeling the strangeness that had stopped her in the first place. It had just been a few feet before she entered the chain link area where they kept the mulch and fertilizer, and to get back there, she was going to have to get closer to the man. Much closer. She was just 11, but I think she was a smart and brave kid. Told me she walked slowly, every step tense as she watched for some sign of him moving toward her. He didn't move a muscle at first, just stared and smiled, his eyes following her as she crept nearer. It was when she was just a few feet from being past him that the smile fell away and his lips began to move. She could hear him speaking, but the words were too low and deep for her to make out anything. Walking faster, she passed within ten feet of him, but he just watched and mumbled as she went past. Until she reached the point of moving away instead of closer, of course. Then he began to turn. She bolted, running back the way she'd first come, knowing that in any second a cold gray hand would close on her shoulder or neck. The feeling of wrongness had been gone for a few seconds, and she could see people moving around in the parking lot now, and when she finally slowed down and looked back, the man was gone. Sandra said she never forgot about that afternoon, but she'd never seen that man again either. She said she'd figured she'd gotten away in time and that she'd left the game behind when she escaped. That was 15 years ago, man. And then last week she was working late. Her office was empty, but it didn't normally creep her out or anything. This time it was different. One minute everything seemed normal. The next, she felt this... She said it was like a weight settling on her, or the air pressure changing way faster than it should. Even after all this time, she knew what it was right away. Her first thought was, it's okay, don't panic. I just need to not play again and leave. It'll be fine. It was then she looked behind her and saw the man from the garden center staring at her and smiling just ten feet away. She ran, of course. Of course she ran, but like I said, she's smart. She made sure she left the same way she'd come into the office and she was bigger than she was when she was a kid, with a much longer stride. She managed to stay away from him until she got out to her car and by then the feeling and the man were gone again. She said at the time she was too freaked out to think straight or make sense of it. She hadn't played the game again, so why had the man come back? It wasn't until she calmed down and thought about it some that she realized the truth. She'd never stopped playing. Sandra said that she thought these weird places, these unsettled spots, were places beside or underneath our world. They looked similar, but they were wrong somehow, and the things that lived there were wrong too. She said that when she left the spot in the garden center, that bad version of the world and the thing following her hadn't just ceased to exist. And maybe it hadn't stopped following her either. It had tracked her over the years, moving behind the world and getting closer when it could. And once it was close enough, it just had to wait until she was in a spot that wasn't right. A place where she could see it again, and it could finally reach out to take her. I... I didn't believe any of this, of course. I thought she was pulling my leg at first, or that she was fucked up on drugs or something, maybe, though I'd never known her to even drink much, let alone anything that would make her delusional, but... The more she talked, the more upset she became and the more determined I became to try and help her. When just trying to convince her that it had to be a false memory or a bad dream didn't work, I suggested that maybe it was a real guy who had just been stalking her since she was a kid. I'd finally tracked her down again and snuck into her building. Maybe. She started crying then. 
said she'd already considered that, even had security pull footage from the office that night. It showed her during the time that she'd started to run away, but the camera couldn't see the man that followed. I wanted to say that was proof it was in her head, but I knew it would just make her angry and she'd pull away. Instead, I told her I believed her, and I tried to help her figure out what we could do to fix it. What I didn't tell her was that I was going to try and play the game myself so I could honestly tell her that it was bullshit and maybe convince her to get whatever help she needed. I wasn't sure if I'd get the chance or if I was going to do it honestly, of course. Just like everybody, I've had times where a place felt weird or creepy and I wasn't sure why, but not like often or anything. And if I didn't run across one of those spots, I either couldn't play the game at all, or I'd have to lie to her and act like I'd found an unsettled spot after all, but then nothing had happened. Funny enough, I walked into one Saturday. I was down in the archives at the library, pulling stuff for that paper I'm working on. It's always super quiet down there. Maybe some people think it's creepy, but I've always liked it. It felt very at home, you know? But as I walked to the back shelves, that changed. It was like I'd walked into a different climate or something. I was confused at first, and even when I thought of the game, I didn't really think I'd found an unsettled spot. But I did think it was close enough that I could tell myself I wasn't lying when I told Sandra I tried the game in the right kind of place and nothing happened. Roy fell silent, staring at nothing for a minute as I waited for him to go on. When he didn't, I threw a napkin at him. Well, did you do it? Did anything happen? His face was pale as he turned to look at me. Yeah, it worked. It was just like she said. There was this girl standing there when I opened my eyes, a bit younger than us. I thought she was a student at first, and she was actually kind of cute, smiling at me the way she was. And I was sitting in the middle of the floor like a goober, after all. Licking his lips, he went on. But she didn't say anything, or move. Didn't respond when I said hey to her, just stared and smiled. I started to get scared. I took a couple of steps back, and she took two steps toward me. I wanted to just run, but I remembered what Sandra had said, so instead, I cut over one row and then went forward. She got in closer, of course, and when I'd cut back over to the aisle that I needed to get out of the way I'd gone in, she was only a few feet away from me, not smiling anymore, mumbling. I frowned at him. Could you hear what she was saying? He shook his head. Hear? Not really, but he sighed, pointing at his ear. Look, I got these implants when I was twelve, but my hearing had started going when I was like five or six. I'd learned to get by by paying close attention to what I could hear and by reading lips. Even now, I still look at people's lips a lot when they talk. I was scared shitless and in a hurry, but it didn't stop me from seeing what she was saying. What was it? Trembling, he looked up at me. It said that it would always find me. And that it was okay. That I couldn't get away because I was already there. That I'd always been there. Sitting back, I puffed out a breath. Oh, fuck, dude. That's a creepy story. You should write that shit down. He stared at me for a moment in disbelief. It's not a story, you asshole. It really happened. I got away from her, at least for now, but... Fuck, man. Sandra's gone. Gone? What do you mean gone? Like, she moved or something? 
Standing up, he started pacing the living room, hands clenching and unclenching into fist. No, like... She fucking disappeared. When I left the library, I went to find her, to tell her I believed her. She wasn't at home, doesn't answer her phone. That was four days ago, and she hasn't been at work or anywhere else. No one knows where she is. Fuck, man, I... I'm sorry, I... I didn't know. Did she call the cops? He nodded. I talked to them. So did her parents in Iowa, who also haven't heard from her. They're actually heading out here tomorrow, or Thursday, I think. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, maybe they can help you find her, and I'm glad to help, too. Roy was already shaking his head. You don't get it, man. They're not going to find her. It's not like the cops found some sign of someone snatching her or something. She just fucking disappeared. Because something is different now. He just raised an eyebrow at him. What do you mean? He kept pacing, his eyes flicking to the window again, and then to the far corners of the room. What are the odds of me finding a weird spot so soon after her telling me about them? It's like... It's like her telling me about it infected me or something, or the guy after her told one of his buddies to start trying to get to me. Give me a door and see if I'm dumb enough to step through. Roy let out a bitter laugh. <laughs> Which I was, and now this bitch is after me, probably looking at me right now, waiting for a chance to push me back into that other version of things and run me down. He glanced at me, his face haunted. That's what struck me last night. Sandra's gone, and they're after me, so I have to stay vigilant. Stay in crowds, avoid spots that are strange, and I need to put distance between me and that girl. Roy gave me a humorless smile. Maybe that's why it took the guy so long to find Sandra again. Maybe it has to be walking or running, you know, steps. If you ride or fly, maybe they just have to stop wherever they are. It's only when you walk away from them that they're going to try and catch up to you. He shrugged. Fuck, I don't know. I, I know that I plan to be gone before her parents get here. They're probably going to think I did something to her if I disappear, but I have bigger problems than that right now. I just... He let out a sigh. <sighs> You're my friend. And I didn't want you thinking I did something to hurt someone when I'm gone, and... His eyes widened. Shit, now that I think about it, maybe I put you in danger just telling you about it. I, I meant it as an explanation, a warning even, but maybe I'm just making it worse. It, I need to go. I tried to stop him, but he wouldn't listen. I hadn't realized it, but... He'd already packed some bags before we sat down to eat, and within a couple of minutes, he'd grabbed them and left. That was three weeks ago, and I haven't heard from him since. Sandra's parents did come by a few days after my last talk with Roy, and the police have talked to me since then, too. Like he predicted, they're suspicious that he's suddenly disappeared, but they don't have any evidence he did anything. Like the rest of us, they're just scared. I haven't slept much since all that. I find myself dozing off at work or taking odd naps when I'm at home without meaning to. It was yesterday when I woke up on the sofa in the middle of the night. I'd heard something, hadn't I? I was disoriented at first, and when I looked around and saw someone standing near the kitchen, my first thought was a happy one. Roy? Is that you, man? The figure didn't say anything. Didn't move. After waking up a bit more, I realized the silhouette looked shorter than Roy's would have been. Heart pounding, I reached over and turned on a lamp. It was a teenage boy I'd never seen before. Just standing there. Staring and smiling. I thought of Roy's story immediately, but I didn't understand. The room, it felt weird. 
The air felt thick and electric, and even though I'd lived there for five years, everything seemed slightly off, slightly alien. No, I... I hadn't played the game. I was just sitting alone with my eyes closed, asleep, and... What had woken me up? It might have been a bell. I stood up shakily. Hello? I tried to make my voice stern. I was the adult, after all. What are you doing here? I wanted to yell at him or to run out through the sliding glass door, but I forced myself to stop and think. How had I come into the room before I fell asleep? Had the room been weird and I didn't notice it, or had it changed while I was asleep? I didn't know if it mattered, but I knew I'd come in through the front door and sat down on the couch to watch TV for a few minutes. I hadn't gotten back up since falling asleep. That meant I needed to go past the kitchen to get back to the front door and get out the way I'd gone in. That meant I'd have to walk within a foot of the thing that was watching me. It was hard to take even a step forward. I didn't know what would happen if it touched me, and I didn't know if it could grab me while I was moving toward it, so as long as I didn't take a step, assuming all these rules were actually rules at all. But I had to try something. I couldn't stay in there with that thing. So I forced myself to take a step, and then another and another, angling myself toward the wall farthest from him while making sure I traveled toward him more than I went to the side. The boy seemed to tense once or twice as though anticipating being able to step forward, but every time I'd correct enough that he had to stay still, his smile seemed to widen a bit as I drew nearer. I was ten feet away when he began to mutter and mumble under his breath his lips moving slow at first and then more quickly as I got closer. I was pressed against the wall now, sliding along it, knocking off a picture and raking my back against the light switch in my effort to stay as far away from him as possible. It was working so far, but my fear was that as soon as I was past him, he'd just turn and grab me before I could get the door open and get away. Drawing even with him, I stopped. He turned to face me, less than two feet between us, but he hadn't reached out a hand yet. My next step? He'd be on me if he could reach me in time. It was hard to think I was so scared. He looked like a normal boy, but he still seemed wrong, much like the room looked normal but didn't feel that way. I could hear his voice, and I thought I could make out a few words here and there, him saying I should just go with him, that it didn't matter because I was already there. God damn it, no. I couldn't listen to that. I had to get away, but the second I... No, I I was just looking at it wrong. The time didn't matter, the space did. If what Roy had said was right, I just had to make a big enough jump that he couldn't reach me in one step. A big enough step to get to the door, open it, and get out with my next one. I looked at the front door and then back at him. I could see him tensing, getting ready to pounce. His legs were a lot shorter than mine, but his arms were long, and I had to stop overthinking it and just go. So I did. Shifting my weight to my right foot, I did a side jump as far and as fast as I could. When I landed, I would have fallen, but for my shoulder slamming into the front door, the knob digging into my head painfully as I slid aside and started to turn it. Opening the door, I looked around. The boy's fingers were inches away from my back. I could try to close the door behind me, but I had no way of knowing it would stop him or even slow him down. Better I just get into the hall and run back the way I'd come. Leaping forward, I could hear him behind me, mumbling faster. One step, and he'd seemed to grow louder. Two and a half, and he was more distant again. There was silence by the fourth, but I kept running. Only when I reached the end of the hallway did I realize the oppressive feeling was gone. Opening the door to the stairwell, I finally looked back for my pursuer. As far as I could tell, 
he was gone. Every word you're about to hear is true. I know what you're looking for. You're here for a scare, but that's not all. You're on the lookout for what's real. Those strange, uncomfortable truths that lurk in the night where the light doesn't shine. You're my best chance at finding someone who will believe me, because if I don't, I honestly might lose what's left of my mind. It started two years ago. My grandmother passed away, and as her only living descendant, I inherited her house. It's been in our family for almost two centuries, but when my friends and I showed up to clean it out, I would have sworn that it had at least three centuries of junk. It was me, Alan, Charlie, Emma, and of course there was Jessica. The plan was to get the house ready for sale. It was too big just for me, and I couldn't afford the taxes on the damn place anyway. I also couldn't afford to hire people to clean it out, so my friends, who were more like family to me at that point anyway, all pitched in to help. The first day went well. We tore through the downstairs and managed to clear out three full rooms. We had pizza and beer that night and watched some ridiculous old movies in the living room where we piled all of our sleeping bags and blankets. It was just like the slumber parties I had as a kid, with the added benefits of alcohol and a little weed. It was day two when things took a turn. I headed down to the basement with Jessica to see how much work we'd beat up against. All the years I'd visited my grandmother, I couldn't remember once going down to the basement, so I had no idea how cluttered it would be. All in all, it wasn't too bad. However, we did find a pantry full of cans and jars covered in a thick blanket of dust. What the hell is this? asked Jessica as she plucked the jar from the shelf. She blew the dust off, which immediately flew back into her face and threw her into a coughing fit. I rolled my eyes as I walked past her. You're an idiot. I saw her toss up a middle finger in my peripheral vision, and I barely held back a smile. I examined some of the items on the shelves, noting that based on the brand logos, they were decades old. Maybe it's a World War II bunker or something, said Jessica, once she'd recover from her paroxysm. There's no way this stuff is... Huh? What? Huh? I picked up a rusting can with a neat, handwritten label. Some of the letters were faded and smudged, but I could still read the date that had been written on it. June 12th, 1929. I'll be damned. This is almost a century old. Jessica's face splits into a grin. Oh, that is disgusting. She dug into the shelves with a renewed vigor, examining everything she found like it was gold. It was most certainly not gold. We're going to have to toss all of this shit. Come on, we can't do that. It's too cool. You're ridiculous. This is not... And anyway, I bet some of this is still good. I gave her a look that must have not adequately conveyed my incredulity because she was still looking at me like I might agree with her. Jessica, what in all of this rotting garbage do you think could possibly still be edible? What's Jessica eating now? We turned toward the pantry door where Emma and Charlie were standing. Oh, nothing much. Just some corn that's been sitting on a shelf for a hundred years. You two want some? Charlie smiled because he'd always smiled at dumb things Jessica did. Emma wrinkled her nose. Uh, Jessica McCree, you are a travesty, she said with such imperiousness all of us had to laugh. Jessica included. Hang on, there is something here that still looks good. Look, said Jessica, as she pulled out a sealed glass jar full of some dark thick substance. Ah, yeah, that looks great, I said, rolling my eyes. No, really, check it out. The label says it's honey, and honey never goes bad. I took the jar from her and saw, indeed, that there was another handwritten label which said, Mumia Honey. 
It was dated August 8th, 1921. It's never been opened, so you know it's still good, she said. Jessica, please tell me you aren't actually going to eat that crap. Jessica, I'll give you $10 if you eat it, said Charlie. There was a twinkle in his eye, the kind he only got when he was riling someone up or looking at Jessica. God, Charlie, don't encourage her, said Emma. She was the youngest and shortest of us all, but she was also the best at making us feel like chided children. Look, let's just toss this stuff and be done with it. Jessica huffed, blowing a strand of hair that had fallen from her ponytail out of her face. Come on, Rennie, aren't you the least bit curious? I'll give you $100 to eat it, amended Charlie. Jessica flashed him a bright, toothy smile. Oh, you are so on. I threw my hands up. Fine. Eat your botulism, honey. I don't give a shit. Just don't take too long, all right? And for God's sakes, don't die before we get all the garbage out of this house. I don't have time to plan a funeral, too. I wanted to be annoyed by their ridiculousness, but I couldn't. And even as I stomped it dramatically out of the pantry, I couldn't keep the smile twitching from my face. It was just so them. Emma playing the responsible, exhausted adult. Charlie following after Jessica like a love-struck puppy. Jessica jumping headfirst into something stupid and reckless. And when we went upstairs, Alan was sitting at the kitchen table, planning the most efficient way to remove the furniture from upstairs like the well-organized dork that he was. I'm thinking we should do furniture last, said Alan when he saw me, as though he hadn't already told us that four times before we even got to the house. Not yet, not yet, said Jessica in a sing-song voice. First, we're having tea. Rennie, where's your grandma's teapot? How do you know she had a teapot? Uh, She was a grandma. Every grandma has a teapot. You're so annoying. There's a teapot in the cabinet in the parlor. I'll fetch it. Alan, get some water boiling and see if there's any tea in the cupboards, I said. Alan looked a little bewildered, but did as I asked. As I went to the parlor, I heard Emma call after me. I want you to know that I'm not supporting this foolishness and will not be participating. Big surprise, I shouted back as I opened the glass cabinet and pulled out a large porcelain teapot with garish pink roses painted in flourishes on the side. It certainly wasn't my style, but I could see some traces of my grandmother in it. By the time I made it back to the kitchen, Alan was up to speed and completely horrified. I ignored their bickering as I poured the water into the teapot. Jessica, this is dangerous and stupid. Please tell me you're not really going to eat that. Of course, I'm not going to eat it, said Jessica, primely gripping a chipped white mug in front of her that she must have rummaged out of the kitchen cabinets. I'm going to drink it. We should designate someone as the official 911 caller, said Charlie. I'll do it, said Emma. You're all being ridiculous, I said, but Alan's seriousness made me nervous. Jessica, you know this is a bad idea, right? My nerves seemed to make her even less concerned. Come on, it's just antique sugar. What's the worst it can do? She took the teapot and poured herself a cup before I could think of a retort. Then she broke the seal on the jar of honey, dipping a small spoon into its smooth surface. She took a generous dollop and plunked it right into her mug. As she stirred it into the tea, she leaned forward, breathing the steam. It smells okay, she said with a shrug. Jessica, wait, said Alan. This is a bad idea, said Emma. Oh my god, she's totally going to do it, said Charlie. Bottoms up, said Jessica, and then she took a drink. I didn't realize I was holding my breath until after she'd sat there for a few moments, smacking her lips. Finally, she wrinkled her nose a little bit. It tastes weird. I let out a sigh. I'm not sure what I was expecting, maybe for her to be struck down dead the second she got the liquid into her mouth, but since it hadn't happened, I felt like we were in the clear. Of course, it tastes weird. It's rotten. 
doesn't taste rotten. It just tastes bitter, kind of gritty. Maybe that's from the tea leaves, said Emma. No, no, I'm sure it's the honey. It's not terrible or anything, just strange. I noticed, though, that she didn't pick up her tea again and didn't finish what was in her mug. Well, now that our wonderful game of try to give ourselves food poisoning is over, maybe we can get back to the actual work? I asked. Jessica laughed. <laughs> All work and no play. But she did stand up and dump the remnants of her tea in the sink. I turned around and headed back for the basement to actually throw away the rotten food this time. As I was leaving with Emma in tow, I heard Jessica say to Charlie, By the way, you owe me a hundred dollars. Wait, what? When did I say that? I, I didn't say that. If you don't cough it up, I'm going to jam the rest of the honey down your throat, you dirty cheat. The last of my anxiety around the event drained away, and I was able to get back to work without it weighing on my mind. I didn't think of it almost at all, in fact, until later that night when we'd all gather in the dining room eating our Chinese takeout. We made great progress, and hopefully we'd be able to finish everything before the week was out. We were understandably in high spirits. Still, I noticed that Jessica wasn't eating. I didn't say anything in front of the others because I didn't want to draw attention to Jessica if she wasn't feeling well. I waited until we were clearing up the remnants of our dinner and I could pull her aside without the others noticing. Are you feeling okay? I asked. Yeah, just... A little bit tired, she said. She smiled at me, but it looked thin, and she was definitely pale. Jess, if you need to go to the hospital, I can have you there in ten minutes, at five even. No, what? Come on, it's not like that. Seriously, I'm okay. I just think I need to turn in early and lay down for a bit. I wanted to insist, to drag her to the car if necessary, but I knew from experience that trying to force Jessica to do anything was an exercise in futility. So instead, I said, there's an extra carton of fried rice in the fridge for you. If you're hungry later, let me know and I can heat it up. She smiled at me because she knew what I really meant was, I love you and this is how I show you. Thanks, Rennie. I love you, she said as she pulled me into a hug. Not long after that, we'd settle down for the night. There was no movies this time. We were all so tired that everyone was out like a light within minutes of laying down. I stayed awake for a little longer, just in case Jessica needed me, but eventually I couldn't fight the heaviness of my eyelids any longer. I couldn't fall deeply asleep that night. I just kept sort of skimming the surface. While I did, I was having some sort of nightmare. Or wasn't a nightmare exactly. If it happens in that smudgy feeling between sleeping and waking, when you aren't sure what's real and what's not, does it count as a nightmare? I just know that I was certain, absolutely certain, that someone was standing in the corner of the room watching us, glaring at us. It was so angry and full of hate. I also knew logically that there was nobody there. It was a dream, but a persistent one that wouldn't loosen its grip on my mind during my brief bouts of consciousness. I'm not sure how long I slept like that, but I know that I woke up around three in the morning to a strange choking sound. It wasn't very loud, but it was insistent, urgent. It was a sound that said, something is desperately wrong. My brain still muddled with fitful sleep. I struggled out of my sleeping bag and staggered to the wall where I flipped on the light. Groans rang out around the room. Emma, who claimed the whole couch for herself, burrowed deeper under her blankets. Alan didn't even stir from where he'd been laying next to me. Charlie cussed me out with feeling, but I barely noticed because I only had eyes for Jessica. She was laying on her back, staring up at the ceiling with unblinking eyes, her face ashen gray. The choking noise was the sound of her trying to suck air into her lungs and failing. Guys, I whispered as she twitched under her blankets. Nobody heard me. Guys, I said louder this time, more groans, but I steamrolled over them. Wake up! Wake the fuck up! Something's wrong with Jessica! 
Charlie was the first one up. He practically launched himself out of the recliner he claimed as his bed and was at Jessica's side, lightning quick. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit, what the fuck is wrong? I knelt next to him, my hands fluttering around her, not sure what to do. We need to call 911. I'm on it, said Emma from somewhere behind me. I hadn't even heard her get up. And then Alan was there. She's not breathing, her throat's closing up, we need to open her airway. How? We all felt so helpless. All we could do was watch Jessica's eyes bulge from her head, her body jerking against the floor like she was having a seizure. Maybe she was. What the fuck did we know? And then something in Jessica's face changed. Her eyes got even wider, like she was seeing something terrible, but there was nothing to look at but our faces above her. Her mouth stretched even wider into a scream, but all she could manage was a low, croaking groan. Her skin started to sink in around her eyes, and then in the hollows of her cheeks, it seemed like her insides had disappeared or something, and her skin was tightening to fit the empty spaces. And then, before our eyes, it started to... There's no other way to describe it. Her, her skin started to dry out like a piece of jerky. It became leathery and rough, almost folding in on itself with wrinkles. Her eyes shriveled away to nothing in her skull. Her gums shrank back, leaving her teeth protruding out of her jaw. All the while, her grunts and groans, her pitiful attempts at screams, became thin and reedy. Soon she was only making a wisp of sound. Shortly after that, it stopped altogether. What we were staring down at wasn't Jessica anymore. It was a dried, desiccated corpse, a mummy. What the fuck? What just happened? Jessica? Jessica, can you hear me? What are you... What's this? Jessica? I sat back on my heels, numb to Charlie's breakdown. He was reaching out for her, then snatching his hands back, afraid that touching her would make it real somehow, or maybe that it would snap her in two. She looked fragile like this, vulnerable, like whatever was left of her could be destroyed in an instant. It was absurd the way I wanted to gather her to me, to lock her up somewhere that she'd be safe. Except there wasn't anything to keep safe anymore, was there? I didn't have to feel for a pulse or check her breathing. I knew she was gone by just looking. Nobody could look like that and still be alive. There's an ambulance on the way and she'd only be... Oh my holy Jesus Christ! Emma's scream was followed by some frantic sounds from her cell phone. The dispatcher asking what had happened, but I couldn't follow what came next. Time seemed to go sort of stretchy like taffy. It didn't seem to be passing at all as I looked down at my dead friend, and yet, all of a sudden, it was gone, and there was a police officer gently pulling me away from the body. No, no, I mumbled. I have to... She needs... I... It's okay. Just take a deep breath. We're gonna go sit over here for a moment, okay? You're doing a great job. Just sit down like that. Easy. There you go. Holy shit, said a stranger. He was someone over by Jessica's body. He was going to touch her. He was touching her. I tried to lurch to my feet, but the police officer in front of me held me firmly down by my shoulders. Don't look there. All right, look at me. That's right, eyes over here. You're doing great. We need a... Oh, Jesus, fuck. We need to get something in her airway. Now! I watched the cop's brow furrow. Whose airway? The girl's. She's not dead. That made the cop break eye contact with me and look over where the corpse, it was a corpse, it had to be, of my best friend lay. Bullshit, he said. You're telling me we have to get her out of here, Tom. Help me get her on the gurney. We have to go now. As they were loading Jessica, she's not alive. She can't be alive. She has to be dead. If she's not dead, then how is she? Why is she like that? I went to a stretcher and into the ambulance. I felt it again. That cold, hateful presence in the corner of the room, watching us. That's when I finally gave myself over to screaming. I 
Jessica survived for 11 days after eating the honey. The doctors were baffled. They brought in specialists from all over the country. They intubated her and sought to keep her breathing, keep her pulse fluttering, even as it struggled to die out. It wasn't their fault. They weren't keeping her alive, not really. It wanted her to suffer. It wanted her to feel the agony of death stretched out over days, not minutes. Not that I know what her death was like. We weren't allowed to see her. We were actually quarantined, all of us. They had no idea what had caused Jessica's condition. For a while, they thought it must be some kind of exotic disease. What else could it possibly be? The police took our statements, and they had questions, but the doctors had even more. They wanted to know every detail of the previous few days. When we told them about the honey, the police went off immediately to bring it in as evidence. They ran every test in the book, but they couldn't find anything to connect it to Jessica's illness. They did tell me what Mumia was, though. I think I went a little crazy for a while after that. I remember clawing at my own face because the pain and horror was so much I couldn't keep it inside and it had to go somewhere, and I remember the nurses in hazmat suits restraining me to the bed. Eventually Jessica's body gave out. Maybe the thing that had its fun had decided to let her die, or maybe her body was simply so ravaged that not even its hatred could keep her going anymore. Whatever it was, I breathed a sigh of relief when they told me she was really gone this time. I'm not sure how long after they kept looking for a cause. There's probably still some doctors and scientists out there trying to understand what killed Jessica McCree. As for me, I guess I'll never know for sure. But I did find some interesting things when I finally left out that hospital and after the police stopped coming by to question me, after the nation had all but decided my friends and I were somehow at fault for Jessica's death. I started researching Momia, trying to understand the side effects. It wasn't much to go on. It stopped being sold in the U.S. as medicine around 1924. Apparently, that was when people realized that ingesting ground-up mummies doesn't actually have any medical benefit. Yeah, you read that right. I searched medical journals and history sites but came up with nothing. Eventually, I ventured into the more open-minded parts of the internet, the places where conspiracy theories thrive and fester. That's where I found stories. Not many, but a few. Urban legends, mostly. Stories passed down through families about ancestors who'd eaten corpses, only to be haunted by the spirits of the dead, angry that their bodies had been defiled. It sounds crazy and impossible, but in every story I read, I saw the reflection of that thing watching us that night. That stare that wasn't there. The answers, if they're out there, won't ever be mine. I'm not strong enough to find them. I wish I knew how to end this story, but when your life becomes a living nightmare, you find that there are no neat, satisfying endings. There's just questions and fear and long, sleepless nights. So instead of an ending, I'll leave you with this. I haven't been back at that house since that night. It stands empty, the inside finally rotting to pieces like it should have long ago. And though I don't live in that town anymore and haven't speak to the others, Alan, Emma, and Charlie since the incident, I can still hear the rumors. They have a way of traveling when they're needed. The local kids are saying that my house is haunted, that there's something in there. A few of the braver ones have gone up to the house, and one or two have even gone inside. And they swear they hear something dragging its feet up and down the halls, followed by the sound of gravelly groans. Some have even seen it, so they say. A gaunt figure with thin, twisted limbs and gray, desiccated skin shambling toward them from out of the darkness. The truth is, I don't know what idea scares me more. That it's Jessica haunting those halls. Or it isn't. <laughs>